you doing tonight? Good? Everybody good? Welcome to all of you who are returning and to any new faces. We have a couple of new people tonight, so we really want them to feel welcome. And um, again, we're, you know, suffering a little bit under this tropical weather <laughs> with no air conditioning in night hall. But um, hopefully everything tonight will stimulate your mind and, and uh, warm your heart. And so it'll be a good night. Tonight um, we have with us Father Armando Vire, who is our parochial vicar. Basically what that means is that he's here to be of service to all of us um, and to be our priest along with Father Brendan and Father Dave. And he's going to be sharing tonight his wisdom about the Old Testament so we've kind of, as you can see, we're progressing. The first night we talked about our search for God and why people search and how they search. And then um, we talked last week about what Catholics believe in general, just sort of clearing up some misconceptions. And I talked to you a little bit about the scriptures last week in terms of how Catholics view the scriptures, which is not a literal interpretation. Um, tonight, we're going to be, as I said, talking about the Old Testament, and the next week, the New Testament, and the following week, talking a lot more about the person of Jesus and what was revealed by him in the New Testament. So three weeks, we're going to be really looking at a lot of scripture. So let us begin tonight with a little prayer, and oh, before I do that, uh, the other announcement I have is um, while Father's talking, I'm going to try to interview some of you that I haven't interviewed yet. There's about 12 of you I haven't interviewed. <laughs> so we're just going to start. Um, I think if you're on the list, Elizabeth probably told you as you came in. Who? Um, yeah. So you're first, Sonny. So you and I will be in the youth room, which is going to be right in there after he begins. Okay? So we'll just try to go in and out and not be too, uh, not distract you, Father. Okay? <laughs> Okay, so let us begin with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's just take a moment now tonight and just uh, center ourselves and to let go of all of the cares of the day. I'm sure that all of us hurried to get here tonight. And so let's just take a moment to just relax and focus inward and try really hard just to connect with the God within. Loving God, we thank you for calling us together tonight on this beautiful moonlit night. And we're especially grateful for the inspiration you've given us to come here and to search for you. And help us to keep our hearts and minds open to the truth, to the message that you might have for us tonight about the Old Testament, the ancient words you've left for us. We just lift up and bless Father Armando as he shares from his heart, his experiences, his joy, and his zeal for this, for the word. We also lift up tonight anyone we might be concerned about, anyone on our hearts tonight that might need our prayers. We send them out into the world through your love. And just help us to listen well and to not be afraid to ask questions. And we make this and all of our prayers in the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you very much. Good evening. It's an honor to be with you and to accompany you in this process, which is uh, a very nice way for you to come uh, closer to our faith and to learn more about it, so you can eventually put that faith, your, that knowledge, in... Um, in your daily life, so you can act according to that faith and share that faith with your family. Because the faith that we receive is not just for ourselves. It's a treasure that we are uh, called to share with others. So what you you receive here, you are called to share with your friends, family members, with the people you interact in a daily basis. So today, as Donna Donna said, um, I will talk about what? 
Do you remember? What's the topic today? Old Testament. And when you hear the word Old Testament, what does it come to your mind? What does it mean to you, Old Testament? Something in a, in a phrase. Do you have to be so elaborated in your answer? <laughs> okay. Before Jesus? Is it what? Ancient stories. Old covenant? Law. So if we are talking about an Old Testament, it means that there is a New Testament. Okay? That you will hear about next week. Today we will talk about the ancient stories, the ancient writings, the ancient books that form the, what, what we call in the, in the Catholic Bible, the Old Testament. And, we will, and I want to be clear that uh, when we talk about the Old Testament, we are talking about the, uh, the first part of the Catholic or the Christian Bibles. Because if you go to Israel and you said, uh, I like your Old Testament. You said to the Jews, I like your Old Testament. They will crucify you. <laughs> because for them, there is no Old Testament. There's only their testament. Because they don't believe in Jesus, the Messiah. So for them, there is no New Testament. So when you talk about the Hebrew scriptures, you talk about the Hebrew Bible. And I will say very briefly about it, because our topic is in the Catholic uh, Bible, which is formed in two sections, the Old Testament and the New Testament. And the Old Testament is considered one of the most influential and important works of literature in the world literature. And this uh, book, this uh, literature has inspired and has provided inspiration for many writers, both religious and secular. And for example, one of the secular, and very secular, because he did not believe in God, one time he said, Nietzsche, uh, a philosopher, a French philosopher, he said in 1886 that the Jewish Old Testament, in the Jewish Old, Jewish Old Testament, there are men, things, and speeches in so grand a style that Greek and Indian literature have nothing to compare to it. One stands with awe and reverence before these tremendous remen, remans, uh, remans of what man once was. The taste for the Old Testament is a touchstone of greatness and smallness. So you can see this uh, literature has provided inspiration for many. It is one of the most important uh, works in literature around the world. So as I said, the Old Testament, uh, if you can try to find in these books, the division between the Old Testament and the New Testament basically is around at the end of uh, page 994. So in the Christian Bible, there is a uh, the first section is called the Old Testament, which is uh, based primarily in the Hebrew Bible, which is a collection of ancient writers, writings by ancient Israelites. And as you can see, it has like the two-thirds of the, the, the Bible. Most of the, the, the book is formed by the Old Testament. And the second part, the Old Testament, is the counterpart of the second section of the Christian Bible, which is also a series of religious writings called or new as the New Testament. The books included in the Old Testament, and when we talk about books, we are talking about the canon. The canon is 
I will say during this uh, uh, talk, I will use the word canon in different occasions. So when you hear canon is uh, the authoritative list or closed number of the writing composed under divine inspiration. And they are written in Hebrew and Aramaic. So the canon is the number of books that form the Hebrew Bible. And these uh, books included in the Old Testament varies between Christian denominations. As you know, there are many Christian denominations, the Catholics, uh, the Protestant, and the Orthodox. For, for Protestants, they accept only those book that are books that are found in the Jewish canon, and they are divided into 39 books. And for the Catholic and Eastern Orthodox, we accept a larger collection of writings. And the books that form the Catholic Bible are 46. And I will say something later about why this division. The Old Testament consists of many distant books written, compiled, and edited by various authors over a period of, of, over periods of centuries. It's not entirely clear at what point uh, the parameters of the Jewish Bible were fixed. But uh, I will say something about the specific Jewish Bible. The books on the, New Test the Old Testament can be broadly divided, and you can see the division, which is on the very first pages of this uh, American Bible that you have in your desk or, or table. You can open it so you can see. There's no number, so it's on the, the very first pages. It says the books of the Bible, and then it says the Old Testament. And the first section is called the Pentateuch, which is the first five books of the Old Testament. Then, even though you have there uh, some other books that are not particularly um, named in this uh, section, they are added there because uh, it belongs in some point to that history. But... The Pentateuch is only the first five books of the Bible, of the Old Testament. Then we have another section called History Books, the Wisdom Books, and the Books of the Prophets. As I said, the first five books are known as the Torah. The Torah is the word uh, used in, in Hebrew to name these five books. In uh, the Christians, we use the word Pentateuch, which comes from the word five. When we call Pentateuch, we are talking about five books. And uh, these five books talks about the Genesis creation narrative to the death of Moses. For example, in the book of Genesis, it describes the beginning of God's covenant with his people, chosen people, and the ancient history of the world. As you know, we have uh, the, the story of Adam and Eve, and then the 12 tribes, etc. The book of Exodus focuses on God's covenant and the law, and also it talks about the Israel's, Israel, Israelites' liberation through their exodus from Egypt. The book of Leviticus consists entirely on regulations that God gave to Moses in the meeting tent in order for them to become a holy nation, personally and nationally. Then we have the book of Numbers in the Pentateuch. These books cover the period of the Israelites that wandered in the desert after they left Egypt. As you know, the Israelites... Uh, walked in the desert for how many years? 
40 years. So it describes this part of the, the walking in the desert by the Israelites. And also focuses on the testing of both the people and the leaders of the Hebrews. And the book's name, Numbers, comes from the two census that the tribes took when they left Egypt and before they enter the promised land. And finally, in the last book of the Pentateuch is uh, Deuteronomy. And this book is called, it comes from the word second law. Because before they enter the promised land, uh, Moses invited the people to renew their covenant with the Lord. So that's why it is called Deuteronomy, which means second law. Then we have the history books, and in them, uh, we have Joshua, Judges, 1st and 2nd Samuel. You can see the index. 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, Ruth, Esther, Lamentations, Judith, Tobit, Baruch, 1st and 2nd Maccabees. And in these books, the book of the history books, uh, we see the history of the Israelites when they con- after they conquest Canaan, the promised land, and when they were defeated and exiled in Babylon in the year 587 before Christ. These historical books do not provide a chronological history. They talk about certain important uh, times and leaders. For example, Dave, Saul, Solomon, etc. And the two books of Chronicles cover much of the same material as the Pentateuch and the Deuteronomistic history and probably date from the year, from the, cent, from the fourth century before Christ. Chronicles links with the book of Ezra and Nehemiah and what probably finished during the third century before Christ. For the Catholics and Orthodox Old Testament, there are two for the Catholics, and four for the Orthodox, books of Maccabees. We have one and two. The Orthodox have four books of Maccabees. Do not ask me why. (laughs) The history books make around half of the total content of the Old Testament. So those books had much of the, the part dedicated to the Old Testament. And, and then we have the book of prophets. And the prophets, as you know, were the chosen men uh, to, who received God's wisdom in order to communicate that wisdom with the people. And in the prophets, we have two sections, the major, uh, the major prophets and the minor prophets. Why do you think we have this section, the major and the minor in the prophets. By the length, exactly. Because, for example, in the major we have, uh, you have uh, maybe in the index over there, we have Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel. And the length of the brooks are larger than the minor prophets which are Hosea, Joel, Amos, Abadiah, Jonah, Micah, Naum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. And these books were written in the, per- in the period of the 8th through the 6th century before Christ, with the exception of Jonah and Daniel, who were written much later. And the books of the prophets warning the people of the consequences of turning away from God. They are always inviting the people to remain faithful to the covenant that they made with God, as we find in the Pentateuch. Okay? So the prophets are always inviting the people to come back to the Lord. And finally, we have the book of wisdom. And in wisdom, we have Job. Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastics, Song of Songs, Zirach, and the Book of Wisdom. 
And these books date from the 5th century to the 2nd and even to the 1st century before Christ, with the exception of the Psalms, who were written in different times. The wisdom literature is mostly instructional. They provide uh, the ancient wisdom that generation has passed by to the other generations. So uh, th this section is my favorite because we have beautiful literature and a lot of wisdom involved when we read this, uh, these books. And the wisdom books dealing in various forms with questions about good and evil in the world. What themes do we have in the Old Testament? Well, the themes are ver various themes. For example, God is constantly depicted as the one who created the world, the one who put in order the world, and the one who guides its history. He is constantly presented as the only one who exists and the only God whom Israel is called to worship. This is, you will find this throughout the Old Testament. There is only one God, and you are called to worship that God. So both Jews and Christians have always interpreted the Bible as an affirmation of the oneness of God. There is only one God. For God is Yahweh, and for the Christians, who is God? The Father? And that's it, right? Or no? Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. So we have three. Three or one? One. One God in three persons. Okay? So even though we have the Holy Trinity, but it's only one God. They form a trinity, individed. They cannot be separated. So, for... And sometimes uh, the Jews think that we adore three, three gods. But even though, as I said, there's three persons, it's only one God. So both the Jews and we adore only one God, the oneness of God. And the Old Testament stresses the special relationship between God and his chosen people, Israel. God chose the Israelites and made with them a covenant. And in this covenant, God promised to be their God. And the Jews promised to be their people. So in this covenant, as you know, God made it with them in Mount Sinai with Moses. Have you been in Mount Sinai in Egypt? Yeah. It's, I was there last year, and it's, it's a beautiful place. And it still is the place of the covenant that God made with the people of Israel. And, but we have a new covenant. Okay? That's, here is... The, differ the difference between the, the Jews and we, the Christians. Because with Christ, we made an eternal and everlasting new covenant. Okay? So, uh, this relationship is expressed well, very well in the biblical covenant between the both, between the two, as I said. Uh, further themes in the Old Testament includes, we see many themes, not only the covenant and the oneness of God. We also, as we read the Old, Test the Old Testament, we read about salvation, we read about redemption, divine judgment, obedience and disobedience, faith and faithfulness, among many other themes. So throughout there is a strong emphasis on ethics and ritual purity, both of which God demands also, although some of the prophets and wisdom writers 
think that God placed a special emphasis in uh, social justice rather than ritual purity. That's why Christ criticized a lot the Pharisees and the scholars of the law because they put a lot of emphasis in ritual purity. And they forget they met at, at a, second, a second level uh, social justice with the poor, with the widow. So even though in the Old Testament there is a strong emphasis in purity, but there is also a great importance in social justice. That's why some uh, wisdom writers and some prophets arguing that God demands social, social justice about purity. And maybe God did not care about purity, purity at all. The Old Testament's moral code enjoins fairness, innervation on behalf of the vulnerable, and the duty of those in power to administer that power with, uh, righteously. It forbids murder, corruption. The Old Testament f- forbids murder, corruption, deceitful trading, and many se- sexual misdemeanors. All morality in the Old Testament is traced back to God who is the creator and the source of all goodness because he is a good God. But there is a problem between uh, the, among the Jews because even though they have a good God who created everything and provided for them and he made a covenant with them, but there also a problem with evil because even though God is good, but how he could allow them to suffer tremendously, being uh, conquered by the Babylons and then exiled into Babylon. But they justify this saying that because there is a lot of sin and infidelity among the Israelites, that's why God allowed evil to come into his chosen people. So we hear about this in the book of uh, history, in the history books of Kings and Chronicles, and also in the, the prophets, especially in Ezekiel and Jeremiah, and also in the poetic books like Job and Ecclesiastes. Now let us talk briefly about the, form, the forming of the canon, how the, the, the canon was formed. Well, the process by which uh, the Holy Scripture, the canon, became a canon was a long one and very complex. Uh, A professor of Hebrew Bible, uh, Timothy Lynn, states that the Old Testament was written in Hebrew in Aramaic. And this collection of books was not written by one man nor did it drop down from heaven, as assumed by fundamentalists. It is not a magical book, but a collection of authoritative texts of apparently divine origin that went through a human process of writing and editing. So this process took many centuries to be completed. It's not entirely clear at what point the parameters of the Jewish Bible were fixed. Some scholars have, opined, have said that the canon of the Jewish Bible was established already by about the third century before Christ. This is the Jewish canon. By about the fifth century before Christ, the Jews saw the five books of the Pentateuch which is the Torah, as having authoritative status. By the second century before Christ, also the book of the prophets have similar status, authoritative status, but not quite in the same level as the Torah. So beyond that, the Jewish scriptures were fluid with different groups seeking, uh, seeing authoritative in different books of the Old Testament. The scriptures, the 
in the, the books of the Old Testament uh, were first, first uh, translated into Greek because uh, later the Greek was uh, very influential in many, can many countries, including uh, for the, he the Israelites, and especially in some countries where they were living exiled in, in the diaspora. So the, the, he the, the Greek became the most important language of that time. That's why the, the Bible, the, Holy, the Old Testament, was translated into Greek in the year 280 and 130 before Christ. So very a few years before Christ was born. And these early Greek translations were called the Septuagint, which means 70, because 70 people were involved in the translation. And this book, the Septuagint, which was the Greek uh, translation of the Old Testament, is the Bible that Jesus and the people of his time follow. They, they were using the Septuagint a lot. And the Septuagint has 46 books and remains the basis of the Old Testament in the Eastern Orthodox Church. So at the time of Christ, there were many people talking in Greek. And eventually, the Roman Empire took uh, Israel, and later the Latin became more important than the Greek. This was during the time of Jesus. So later, the Greek, the, the Old Testament was translated into Latin. So in the Western Christianity, or Christian in the Western half of the Roman Empire, Latin has displaced the Greek as a common language. So in the year 400 after Christ, Pope Damasus I commissioned a great scholar of the day, St. Jerome, to translate, translate or produce the Latin Bible. So sometimes in the centuries after the Septuagint, this translation into Greek, the rabbis, the religious leaders and scholars and teachers define the Jewish canon, which is a uh, much a uh, shorter canon of only 39 books. Okay, first we have the Septuagint of 46 books before Christ, uh, one century before Christ. And later, after Christ, the rabbis uh, choose the canon, and they accepted only 39 books. The Septuagint has 46 but they chose only 39. St. Jerome based his translation into this Jewish canon of the 39 books for his translation into the Latin Bible, which is called the Vulgata, which comes from the Latin vulgar, which is the common language, not a sacred language like the Hebrew or the Aramaic. So, this uh, Vulgate contained only 39 books. And is the Bible used in the Western Church, while in the East Church, they use the Septuagint, the Greek uh, translation. So, Jerome, this holy man, and very smart, had wanted to drop all the books that did not appear in the Hebrew Bible. But St. Augustine, another very intelligent man, a great scholar of the time, and a bishop, uh, he opposed St. Jerome. And he said, no, we need to come back to the origin with these 40, 49 books. So there was, there was a great debate in the year 397 in, in, um, in, in which they decided that according to 
St. Augustine, they will keep the 49 books originally selected, not the 39 that the Jewish only chose. So this debate was won by St. Augustine, and later in the 16th century, the Protestants reopened the debate, and they uh, follow only the Jewish Bible. For them, they chose only this canon made by the Jewish after Christ. That's why for them, there's only 39 books. Whereas for us Catholics, we follow St. Augustine and the Council of Rome and Carthagian, that we keep the 49 books that are called in the Septuagint, the original books. So that's why there is this separation. Why we have 49 and they have only 46 and they have only 39? Because we follow the, uh, the canon that the church chose according to the original translation of the Septuagint. And the Protestants, following the Jewish tradition, they chose only the 39 books that they chose for their canon. There is some Christian theology in the Old Testament, even though Christ is not mentioned, but in the Old Testament, they are talking about the anointed, somebody who will be anointed and will ascend into heaven. And of course, uh, at the time of Jesus, they were expecting that the Messiah, which is the anointed, or the Christ in the, in the Greek, will appear very soon. Somebody in the flesh, in, in blood, that will come to establish the, the Jewish uh, kingdom and destroy the Roman Empire. And they were waiting this, still until now, they are waiting the Messiah. So for us, we know that we follow uh, the profession of faith made by St. Peter, that you are the Christ, the Son of God. So that's why then we have the New Testament or the New Covenant, because later we found that Jesus was already with us, and he made a covenant with us on the cross. In another, in another mountain, in Calvary, like with Moses was in Mount Sinai. So this is more or less uh, a brief introdu introduction to the Old Testament. The, the covenant that God made with his chosen people and the instruction that he gave them to remain faithful to him and to always worship him and to not to be uh, attracted, seduced by the other uh, empires where they were called to worship different gods. For, for the, uh, the Jewish people, the covenant is only to worship God. And this is the core of the Old Testament. There is only one God, and you are called to worship and to follow that God. If you don't obey this God, if you are unfaithful to this God, then punishment will come upon you. So, I think there is a time for questions later. Yes. Exactly. They are still everything. Whatever you you do, whatever you you see them doing, praying and wearing. Have you seen those Orthodox Jews who are with the with the hats, with the how do you call these things? Everything. Have you been in Holy Land? Well, everything they do is to ask asking God to send His Messiah. And they're still waiting for them. Everything they do, and everything they don't do because they are in some way making sacrifice because they cannot be happy people until the Messiah comes. 
because how can they be happy if their people is suffering and the Messiah is not there? So they are, those are the fundamentalistic Jews who don't live a very happy life. That's what uh, I was tell, told by our guy there, uh, a very smart uh, scholar, that they, everything they do is asking the Lord God to send the Messiah. And they cannot, they cannot be happy even though they have a family and they have intimacy, but nothing can be joyful until the Messiah comes down. The part of the answer is given in the, the same uh, in the same Holy Scriptures in the in the Gospel, where it is says that the the high priests and the Pharisees instructed the soldiers to tell that the body was stolen by their followers, and that uh, he died in the body. You know, for us here he uh, resurrected, but and he says that this is the story that the body was stolen and that ran until our time. And we, we are talking about the year uh, 50, 60 after Christ, that uh, they, they believe that there was an invention of those followers of, of the Jesus, the historic Jesus. Okay? Because historically, it is written that Jesus lived. There is a uh, track of this, and that he was died and everything crucified. But uh, the, the Pharisees and the scholars of the law instructed the people to not believe in the theory of the resurrection, that the body was told. You're welcome. I think there's a time to, to rest, and then... It's a break, right? Okay. And then you will have time to ask more questions. I don't know if I will answer them. <laughs> oh, they can, you can write down your questions. Okay. Okay, take a, a break, and uh, we will let you know when. The next 10 minutes or so, or, um, or 10 or 15 minutes, and just talk at your tables. And I want you to come up with some really good questions to ask Father Armando. <laughs> <laughs> Poor guy. Anyway, um, if you would just talk to the team members, they can help you maybe generate some questions. Um, I'm sure you have many about the Old Testament. So let's, let's just do that now. Let's have some process time. Thank you. Start with the questions and answers. Uh, how old are you? Uh, no, no. no, this question is not good. No. Okay, thank you for the questions. I will try to give my best answer. If I cannot say something that I've, I haven't read them all, so I will be honest and let you know that next time. Okay? How should, how should you read the Old Testament? How should you read? Okay. Well, we can read the Old Testament as a revelation of God. God is revealing himself through the different periods of time. In the same way as a father or mother try to reveal to his or her son or daughter in part, you know, if the child is in, the, the son or the daughter is um, months old, he will try to reveal a nice, gentle, I was laughing and caring, right? You won't say, don't do this. The poor kid will be scared. So you are revealing yourself as a mother, as a father, according to the child age. So the Old Testament should be read as an, a revelation of God in the different history periods and through different situations that the people were living. Okay? God is revealing himself in the Old Testament. And why did the Protestants decide that they wanted the Jewish translation instead of the Septuagint? Because uh, these Protestants were fundamentalist Jewish, uh, 
uh, Christians who wanted to go to the basis of the, the faith according to their belief. They thought that because the Jewish translation are rooted in uh, the, the language that it was written, so they th thought that that was the divine origin canon. So they wanted to follow this translation or this number of books instead of the Septuagint because the Septuagint uh, was based in also some parts of the Bible, the Old Testament, that was uh, written in, in Greek. For example, some parts of Daniel is written in Greek. And they don't accept this because they think that Greek is not uh, the, the language chosen by God. Only Hebrew and Aramaic. That's, go, that's why uh, they chose only those books who were written in, a, in a Hebrew, Aramaic, or uh, in the periods of time that they thought uh, that the original book because some books are written in sections, like Isaiah. It's written in three different periods of time by three different groups or schools. So not only was written by uh, the prophet itself, then the continuation of the school wrote uh, the different parts of the book. So that's why there is a variation and decisions to choose what books and what not. If the Pentateuch is five books, why is there eight listed? As I mentioned, they put in the Pentateuch eight books, which is not the customary uh, idea to do, because Pentateuch five means five. Genesis and uh, uh, Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy, Numbers, Leviticus, and uh, Exodus. Those are the only five books allowed to be in the Pentateuch. And these books form the Torah, which is the law of the Jews. They don't allow any other books. They chose to put these books here, like Joshua and some, I think it's Ruth, because they are part of the, the history from the creation until the promised land. Remember, Joshua is the leader. After Moses died, Joshua takes the leadership of the Hebrews to enter into Canaan. So that's why I think they decided to put those books into this category because they narrate the story of the, from the creation until the entrance to the promised land, which is a period of time. The Holy Scripture is not... We are not following the times. For example, Genesis was written in the 18th century before Christ, and the last book of for Psalm were written in the first, uh, the first century before Christ. And so there is a um, chronological no. The Old Testament is, is uh, established by periods of time, and not necessarily they were written in the same periods. Am I clear? It, it, it's very hard because uh, it's a very complex uh, process to put those books into the order or the canon that we have. But the Old Testament is not chronologically uh, written like we have it, thinking that the Old Testament, the, the, book, of Gen the book of Genesis was written uh, 18th century before Christ? No. It is by periods of time and in and, uh, and the history that they are uh, putting. For example, if they found a book of the Maccabees and it's part of the, they narrate the, the, the problem that the, the Hebrew people had with the judges. So, even though it was written much later, but they put it into the section of a historical books, even though it was written 
just like a year before Christ. Am I, am I clear? So they put it in that category because it belongs to that period of time. Do the Jews still consider themselves the chosen people? Ask them that question to them, and you will find. <laughs> of course, of course. Especially the, the fundamentalistic, those uh, very orthodox, the one I mentioned to you, that they are praying over there in the, in the wall, and uh, they consider themselves the chosen people. And if you go to their land, if you find some who is a person who is very fanatical, like one of the deacons was telling me in uh, St. Mary's in Fullerton, that he was pitied by a fundamentalistic Jew because they think that, especially the Christians, are profanating their sacred territory because they are the chosen people. Why were the seven books of the original Bible omitted from the Protestant Bible? Well, I mentioned this before, according to the language of the, the period. There are Jews today, well, this, I will leave this question because Donna wants to answer this. Who wrote the Pentateuch? Well, there is no one author who wrote all these books. And again, they, are, they were written in different centuries. So no one will leave two or three centuries to write the whole five books. So some attribute to Moses most of uh, the Pentateuch, especially the Exodus and Numbers and Deuteronomy. But uh, the Pentateuch is, for example, Genesis is written by schools of, of rabbis, of people who try to put into uh, writing the creation. So we don't, we don't know who wrote exactly those books. We know that there are schools and some of part of the Old Testament, especially the Pentateuch, was a tribute to Moses. Um, we know that Jesus is merciful and a peaceful God. But why is Father Armando so angry? Nothing. <laughs> but why is God... In the Old Testament, a vengeful God who caused great suffering and punishment for their people. This doesn't seem to be the God that Jesus teaches about. Yes, as I said, uh, the people were understanding God. Remember that the, the writings comes from original inspira- from divine inspiration but written by human beings who understood that what they had in mind was a God's revelation. But they put their own feelings in the same way. It's not that God was telling him, write this, I, God, want you to, like, no. They felt like, uh, more or less, like some... uh, holy men or women who had some revelation, and then they put into writing something that God is telling them, but in their hearts, what they think God is telling them. But they are using their own language, their own feelings. So the people were different uh, or were acting differently according to the periods of time. For example, in some point, at some point of the, of the history of the Hebrews, they were suffering tremendously, and they thought that God was angry with them because they, they sinned a lot. So they, they wrote, Oh God, you who abandoned me because you said you will suffer because you, etc. So they understood that God was angry with them because they were unjust, unfaithful, and sinful with them. And God, as I said, is revealing himself in the Old Testament. But Jesus, that's why Jesus is the center of the history, because 
He is God incarnate. And we know how God is through Jesus because what Jesus said is God's words incarnated. The other are revelations, human beings, prophets, divine, um, uh, sacred authors. They understood that God was telling them to write this and they put into writing what they th- received from God but with their own feelings and their own uh, ideas. Okay? That's why and remember that before in the history of the Hebrews there were a lot of they were trying to conquer their promised land and there were tribes people who are very angry or very uh, in a very uh, how to call it bellicose way so they were fighting for their lives and for their beliefs and everything. So they were always trying to defend themselves against others, to be conquered, to destroy, etc. So and God was accompanying these people, and they were trying to understand God. But the only God that we know is in Jesus Christ, the fullness of the revelation. And God is merciful and compassionate, and so is God from the Old Testament. And he was in some way saying, I am, and we have many beautiful images of God and loving God in the Old Testament. When he says, for example, uh, I love you more than thousands of mothers will love uh, your child. I uh, go down and take you into my arms and put you next to my cheek and kiss you something. So God is merciful, compassionate, but the people were understanding God according to the circumstances they were living. As Catholics, do we follow the Old Testament or the New Testament? What do you think? Both. That's why in the in the in the that's why we have the Bible. We have both, and in the in the Mass. We always read, not always, but most of the times, we read, the first reading is taken from the Old Testament. And the Gospel is, as we know, for the New Testament. Why? Because the Old Testament is the anticipation that, that God made in Jesus Christ. So that's why there is a connection always, except in during, during Easter with the first reading in the gospel. What God said or what was happening in the Old Testament, Jesus is the fullness of that revelation that is taking place in Jesus Christ. So we follow both. We cannot understand the Old Testament without the New Testament. And we follow both because both are God's word. Um, why did the Eastern Orthodox Church accept the Maccabees 3 and 4? How many Maccabees books did Augustine accept? Only the one we have. The canon that we have is that the one that Augustine uh, accepted, and not only him, by a council, a council of Car- Carthagian and Rome. So they decided to accept that. I don't know exactly about if the book of Maccabees, uh, the author that accept uh, four, maybe because, as I said, it was written later and in different language, for example, in Greek. And they doubted it was ex- or, uh, completely from divine origin. Uh, you say the Old Testament is the Holy Scripture. Yeah. When we talk about Holy Scripture and Bible, we are talking about the same. But when we talk about the Bible, we talk about the number of books or the books that are that form the, the sacred Scripture or the canon. This is the Bible. But when we talk about the Holy Scripture... We talk about in general, in the whole revelation. When we talk about the Bible, we talk about the, the material 
the the comprise uh, books that form the Bible, and you know that the the word Bible means books, so it is the same, but in with different little connotation. This is the Bible, and when I talking and reading or mentioning about the a holy scripture, when we read it, do we read it as as history, poetry, etc.? There are two ways. If I'm studying Holy Scripture, if I'm going to to make a doctor or whatever, I'm studying as a as a as a history, as a book of study. Even though it's God's word and uh, it's the Holy Scripture, but there are different ways to see at the book. I, it, it can be taken as an instrument of study with a purpose to understand, to decide the formation, for example, the words that are written, why this style, why the other, etc. So, but if I'm going to uh, a spiritual class, then we read it as the Word of God, as it is, not with intention to, to understand the style or the period, of etc., even though it is uh, the psalm, for example, there are lyrics, uh, uh, poetry, lyrics, and uh, the, song of, the song of songs is uh, poems. We read as it is. If it is uh, the styles varies, narration, uh, songs, uh, poetry, we read it in, under those uh, categories, but even though they are poetry and uh, history or narration, is the Word of God. If there is, uh, you need to clarify something, let me know, okay? As I'm answering this que- the question. Is the God of Israel the same God as Allah in Islam? What do you think? No? It's a very tricky question, isn't it? Because for us, God is merciful and compassionate. We cannot imagine God asking to kill somebody. So we have here a, a different mentality, that these people is formed in a very different mentality, very different way, now and centuries and centuries before. We follow the same God but under different perspective. Okay? It's the same God. For them, Allah is a name that they give to Yahweh. For them, Allah is the, the God who chose Abraham, like is for us. And Abraham had two children. Remember? Which one? Isaiah and Ishmael. And who is the, the son of the covenant? Isaac. And the other is the son of adultery. So, as we read in the Holy Scripture, Agar, what do you call Agar? Agar? Agar leaves, and Abraham allows us to live with uh, Ishmael, because that is not the son of the covenant. And the Islam's follow come from Ishmael, from this side. But both have as father of faith, Abraham, and God, the same God, called Abraham, the father in faith. But they have a different perspective. Why? Because this is a different mentality. Okay? But it's the same God. Questions? What are the different levels of Judaism? Orthodox, Reform, others? Why different types? It's the same question like we have, why so different types of Christians? We have hundreds of denominations. Right? Tomorrow can start, somebody can say, I'll start a new church. Okay? And it's the same with them. 
Some are... Right now, if you go to the Holy Land, you will see people that are Jews who do not practice their faith. Like right now, you see people, Catholics, who do not practice their faith. And you see some who are very fundamentalists, like these people with a hat, with a black, and they don't have any joy, etc., because they are waiting the Messiah. In the same way, we have fundamentalistic Christians who only follow what is written and nothing else. They don't follow the tradition, the oral tradition. So there are many groups and uh, separation because it's like any other group. They are wanted different, different ways of living the faith, and they start separating, bringing something different. So that's why there are so many um, different groups of Jewish. What is a um, summary Overview of the seven last book from the canon. What is a summary? What is a summary? Oh, what are the seven books of the canon? Well, and there are in the in in your Bibles you you will see. I think is there those the books that are not in um, the the Catholic canon, and uh, you can see them and. There are some like Ruth, uh, Maccabees, and some of them talk about the history of the Israel. Okay, so Daniel, for example, is not allowing some. What did the Jewish Israelites not see in Jesus when he came, when he came to lead them to believe? that he is not the Messiah. What did the Jewish Israelites not see in Jesus when he came to lead them to believe that he is not the Messiah? Uh, who or what do they feel Jesus is? For, for them, Jesus is... Uh, for them, for the Jews, for the Israelites now, again, it depends of what group you, we are talking about. Because there are some groups who are called them Messianic Jews, who believe in Jesus. Not exactly in the same way that we believe. But there are others for the fundamental the Orthodox uh, Jews, who for them Jesus is a, a fake person who, uh, I don't know how to say in English, the exact word, impostor, you know how to say imposter, who call himself the son of God. That's why they kill him. And for them, for many of those uh, fundamentalists, it's still the same. Uh, Jesus is seen in different ways depending what group we are talking about. It can be for someone who is uh, a prophet, somebody who is, has divin, divin, divine origin, or someone who is uh, totally an, an imposter, like uh, in the time of, of the Lord with the with the Pharisees and the scholars of the law, etc. Is the Pentateuch is five books? Why? Is, well, I already say this. Do the Jewish still consider themselves? That, uh, yeah. So, yeah, I already answered all those questions, right? There, no. Why there are seven books of the original Bible? Yeah. Any other question that is not that you want to ask? If not, you will understand. Maybe have a different or better clarification next week when you hear about the New Testament, which is a continuation of this and and the, the understanding of many things that appear in the Old Testament. Any questions? Personal questions? <laughs> well, it was an honor to be with you tonight and to share our faith, which is very rich and very beautiful, especially when it's lived. And so I encourage you to, what you receive here, try to put it into practice and share it and um, treasure it with something very, very sacred because it is sacred. We are like uh, those kind of Cofres, how do you say cofre? Where the treasure is. When, treasure what? 
treasure chest? Okay. Where the God puts or uh, the faith in our hearts. And it's something that we need to treasure and to value and to keep it and defend it from the evil one who wants to destroy it, to, to steal that faith. Now you are learning and you feel in heaven when you come to RCIA and you think she's marrying. <laughs> but later, if you, if you are not very solid in your faith, Somebody will come and will say, no, you are wrong. This is not exactly. And, and they, you will start doubting about your faith. And eventually, because I've noticed and I met people who have lost their faith. So treasure that faith, value it. Thank that faith to the Lord because it's a gift to be a Christian and to know and to love and to follow Jesus Christ. So thank you for this time, and I hope to see you soon. And indeed, I will see you in January with another talk. If you don't want me to come, just say to Donna. <laughs> God bless you. Good night. Thank you so much, Father. Uh, uh, what? Okay. Um, just to end tonight, um, I did get to interview five of you, so that means seven of you I still have to, to, to do. So don't worry, we'll get to you sooner or later, um, and it's always a pleasure to do that. So, so don't worry if I ha didn't get to you tonight. I'd like to end by um, doing a little prayer, which is based on the scripture. So if you have a Bible on your table, um, we're going to look up. I'm going to see how you, how you do here. Maybe you can have the team help you. Okay, I want you to find the book of Psalms, the book of Psalms. So if you, see if you can find the book of Psalms. And if you don't have one, maybe look on together. There might be an extra one or two on this table, right? You could maybe help. Maybe this table needs an extra one because I took it from them. So did you find the book of Psalms? And I want you to find Psalm 23, Psalm 23 which is a psalm that a lot of people know. Anybody find the page? Five, five, nine, five, fifty, nine, page five, fifty, nine. If you're in, if you're in this book, you may not be in the same Bible. Who hasn't found it yet? Have you all found it? You got it? Okay. I want you to know that there are many ways to read the scripture and there's many ways to be with the scripture. One of them is to just read the Bible. Um, and a lot of people, especially in the Old Testament, maybe Father already said this, I'll just say it again. In the Old Testament, sometimes it's really difficult to get through. The first five books, um, you know, like Genesis, pretty easy. Exodus, really exciting, all about Moses. You know, but when you start to plow through Deuteronomy, it's all about the laws, and it's one law after the other in Leviticus. Things can bog down, really quite seriously bog down. So um, I will bring in, hopefully somebody remind me next week, I'll try to bring in a, a way for you to read through the Old Testament that will keep you interested in moving forward, because there's about 14 books in the Old Testament that if you read them all, you kind of will get the whole gist of what's going on, you know? Not that you shouldn't read it all. If you want to read it all, more power to you. But if you're having trouble with it, that's a way. Also, we can pray with the scriptures. We Sometimes we read them and we think we're just going to get, like, information about things or or just we're going to understand certain stories, and, and we're reading for content, you know. But other times, you really want to just sit with it as a prayer. So there's a lot of places in the Old and the New Testament you can do that. This, and, and this is a prayer process which is called Lexio Divina <clears throat> in Latin. Lexio, reading, divina, divine, divine or sacred reading of the scriptures. Basically, what they're saying is we're going to use the scriptures to 
for prayer. Not for content, but for prayer. One of the, the psalms are a really great place to do that. There's 150 psalms. So if you don't pray and you want to try this, try reading one psalm every day for 150 days. That's going to take you a few months, right? <laughs> Some of them are really short and won't make any sense at all, but read them anyway. Some of them will be so beautiful that you, it, you'll want to stay on one verse. Others will be like um, songs of lamentation will make you cry. Some of them will be songs that will charge you into battle, <laughs> you know. So I would just challenge you, if you want to start praying with the scriptures, that might be a good way, place to start. What I found from reading the Psalms, and I try to do this pretty often, I like to go back to them. What I do when I read them is I find that somehow or other they are always speaking to me about my life. <laughs> so weird, you know, how can that happen? But it does happen. Um, and also, after if you've read them over and over, and you also hear them at Mass, too, by the way, um, they start to really fall into your heart, and you start resonating with them. It's like familiar territory that you're going over and over again, and that's what prayer really is about, is having that cry come from your heart. <clears throat> so Psalm 23 is one of the most beloved psalms put to music many times. A lot of people know it. You'll probably hear it at every funeral or every, every wedding, you know, because it's, so, it's talking about Jesus as a shepherd. So I just thought tonight um, that we could end with um, this psalm. And if you look at it, look how short it is. Not very long, is it? Okay. So think about it. Okay, if you only had to read Psalm 23, that wouldn't take you very long, would it? But it would anchor you, and you might want to read it more than once, okay? So let's, let's just, we're going to be like monks in a monastery. The monks in the monastery always read the Psalms, and they would read them by going back and forth between two groups. So I'm going to divide the room right here. You'll be with them, and you'll be with them, okay? So we're going to read, try to look on with somebody if you can. And so we're going to start on the right-hand side, and you're just going to read two lines, and then the next, then you read the two lines, and then we'll read, and then you'll read. This is the way the monks prayed these. And by the way, priests, bishops, cardinals, the pope, they all read scripture every day in what's called the liturgy of the hours, okay? Or they sometimes call it the breviary, and in the Liturgy of the Hours, it's all psalms and then some readings from part of the other scripture, but mostly they're reading the psalms. And so you're in really good company if you do this, okay? All right, so um, we're going to begin as we do at all prayer. We'll just, I'll do the blessing. Bruce and I were talking, and he was telling me that it's really foreign to him to do the sign of the cross, and he says we do it too, I do it too fast. So, <laughs> so. That's a really, I told him, well, that's a really good, I, I like that feedback, you know. <clears throat> but you don't have to do the sign of the cross. If you don't feel like, feel it yet, don't do it. You can always practice it at home if you want. But it's a simple prayer, you know, where you're touching your forehead, then you're touching your abdomen, and then you go to the right shoulder and then to the left shoulder. So you're making a cross. Uh, just keep remembering Jesus on the cross. And so it's, you know, in the name of the Father, then it's the Son, and then it's the Holy Spirit. That's all it is. So anyway, we will begin with that. You don't have to do it if you don't want to. I won't look. Okay. You can look down. So I don't care who does it or doesn't right now. So, but let's try to put ourselves into a prayerful place. Sometimes it helps to close your eyes just for a moment to just get all the distractions away. And just to have this gazing inward, just try to kind of focus your attention inward. God dwells within us all. And we will begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So let's start on the right. The Lord is my shepherd. There is nothing I should lack. 
In green pastures you let graze, in safe waters you you restore my strength. Guide me along right path. Even when I walk through the valley, I fear no harm, for you are at my side. And you staff courage. You set a table before me in the in the enemy's watch. Where are we? I think we're on the left now. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Only goodness and love will pursue me all the days of my life. I will dwell in the house of the Lord for years to come. Okay, let's just let those words sort of sink in, look back over them again. listen to these words once again as our final prayer the Lord is together the Lord is my shepherd there is nothing I lack in green pastures you let me graze in safe waters you heed me you restore my strength you guide me along the right path for the sake of your name even when I walk through a dark valley I fear no harm, for you are at my side. You rock and staff give me courage. You are, Saint Satan, for me, in the enemy's watch. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Only goodness and love will pursue me all the days of my life. I will dwell in the house of the Lord for years to come. And so, loving God, we thank you for our gathering tonight. We thank you for sending us Father Armando, who is here to share his wisdom with us. And I ask a blessing now upon all here present as we return to our homes. Give us a restful night. Speak to us in our dreams. And if it be your will, another day tomorrow to get to know and love you more. Help us to be kind, to follow the path, and to feel your light and your hand upon us. And we make this and all of our prayers in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless you all. We'll see you next week, hopefully. God willing.